The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin is another one of these gigantic science fiction books, not in terms of size, but kind of the aura around it for the genre. And I was really pumped to get into it, and only more excited from a discussion angle when I realized it's a science fiction book, a classic science fiction book, that's tackling ideas around gender identity, which I'm sure is a subject that's just going to go over incredibly smoothly in this comment section. <laughs> That was sarcasm. But before we get into the actual book, though, I do also want to say thank you, everyone, who's kind of been engaging with more, enjoying these on-location book reviews. I have a lot of fun doing them, and you all seem to like the change-up in setting. I don't blame you. It's certainly different than my backdrop. And Massachusetts this time of year is just unbelievably nice. Or you all just see my additional need for sunshine. Either way, I appreciate it. But The Left Hand of Darkness, yes, is about a human man being sent to an alien planet called like Gethane. Gethane it's a sci-fi word. And he's trying to get the two governments on this planet to agree to join the Intergalactic Interstellar Trade Network. But that is just simply a setting, and as great science fiction does, what Le Guin focuses on here is crafting a specific mirror, a narrative lens, to hold up and reflect back at us. If you can, please just read the introduction to this book by Ursula K. Le Guin. It is one of the most thought-provoking, quotable, and insightful monologues about what it means to be a creative, a science fiction author, and I learned a lot from it. So just read that alone if you can, but this is a Left Hand of Darkness review. And when it comes to this book, I think what I end up really liking almost the most in terms of its setup and setting is this is a first contact story, but not from the lens of, oh, humanity is being visited for the first time, but instead we are visiting them. And if you're a fan of Star Trek, you've seen this concept before, right? Oh, we got to make the first contact and there's rules to be followed. But the narrative focus isn't really what you would expect because whenever Star Trek or many other science fiction stories try to like delve into subjects like this, it becomes about the faults of humanity preventing this process from going oh so smoothly. Look at Arrival. Alien. We don't know what he really wanted. Looked like he was trying to put us in some nice comfy sacks. looked like he was trying to put us in some nice comfy sacks. So instead, we're kind of getting this reaction to humanity first contact from these governments, this genderless society. And the choice is made to have Ginley uncomfortable by this. He's not a bigot. He's not tainted with hatred. But instead, it's unfamiliar. And so he struggles with seeing things like a king who was pregnant or meeting a man who used to be a woman and things along those lines, the gender fluidity conversation. And there is a very important distinction between bigotry and internalized, whatever you want to call it, that is affecting Ginley's interaction with these people. He's not malicious. He is not trying to get these people to change. And instead, we see a lot of just internal struggles, him trying to come to terms with differences. Yet Le Guin's approach to building the society that is both genderless, gender fluid, is kind of two-pronged. It is, of course, meant to create this sense of alien, different, other, but it's also being used to kind of ask the question, what would humanity be if you strip away the divides of gender? There are huge concepts within our culture in all kinds of ways, and so Le Guin then, as any great sci-fi author would do, extends that exploration to look into sex, marriage, commitment, children. That is the first prong. The second prong of Le Guin's world building here is clearly just her having a hell of a lot of fun. She's using this desolate ice world that is so much colder than what we are used to, almost mockingly, as she then turns around and injects so much warmth and humanity into these people. Yes, they're on a desert barren wasteland, but internally for better and worse, their personalities are just overflowing with emotion and honesty. And we'll get more into that in a bit later. Let's focus on Ginley first. To be clear, Ginley is able to accept that alien life is different than his own. His problem does not come from a source of feeling better than, superior, and instead it's just a lot of the big questions he needs time to process about the implications for the society, future relationships with humanity, and just taking in 
so much that is new. And then there's a flip that happens, a more familiar that Genli is able to be introduced to, but more familiar does not equal kinder or more accepting. Scheming, politics, flaws, humanity still exists within these aliens. I guess humanity is a wrong word, though it's the word we use to describe this fundamental bit of existence that comes with being sentient life. The ant is not reflective of the hive, and the hive is not reflective of the ant. They may be better in some ways, they may be worse, but individuals are going to individual, and here is where Genli is able to find some comfort in the discomfort, in the unfamiliar, and he's able to spot the same flaws within what is familiar. I'm not going to spoil things here, but getting a little bit clear, he interacts with two different governments, the factions on this planet. One is a lot more like what he is used to. But uh, look at humanity real quick. <laughs> Do we want alien life to be more like us? How funny, I'm sitting here recording a review about a book that revolves a lot around gender identity and someone wrote penis here on this log. Humanity. I have a bird here with me now. Hello, bird. I hope you don't get too much closer, but I kind of hope you get in my shot. I would say you could put the label on Ginley's internal conflict as like a deconstruction of tribalism, but tribalism doesn't feel exactly like the right word. Essentially, it is the internal war many of us feel when we're just experiencing culture shock. I've visited a few other countries, lived for a while in one, saw some things that made me a little bit uncomfortable, but I had to realize it's not my place to say anything or judge. And the external conflict comes from something that reflects the internal conflict happening within Ginley. Le Guin did not forget that these societies are gonna have their own biases, their own preconceptions. And if you're curious about the world building that's happening here, Le Guin has managed to use the iceberg theory of world building to tremendous effect by giving us all these details of why wider political conflicts already happening within these worlds, but then having Ginli meet and explore this world through smaller communities. It's so effectively done that it doesn't even feel like an iceberg. It feels like you're just standing atop a mountain, a weight you are much closer now. And that top-down world building also adds to the weight of the responsibility on Genli's shoulders. He's an emissary, a diplomat, interacting with people who have long existing schemes and political plans that he's stepping into as a chaos factor. So yeah, he's viewed in several different ways. We see him treated as if he's a spy, a zoo exhibit, a welcome friend, enemy, diplomat, and everything in between. And it's as you reach the second leg of this book where the conflict for Genli, the danger, rises that you really begin to see the full picture that Le Guin is painting. Looking back into that mirror Le Guin has so painstakingly set up, what is left after you strip away the conflicts of gender, the most supreme labels we assign each other immediately at birth? After reading Left Hand of Darkness, it would seem Le Guin is saying, we're basically just still human. We assign labels we other people so aggressively to strip yourself of what is most vital when looking at another. And I saw it then again, and I saw it for good. What I had always been afraid to see and had pretended not to see in him, that he was a woman as well as a man. Any need to explain the source of that fear vanished with the fear. What I was left with was, at last, an acceptance of him as he was. Until then, I had rejected him, refused him as his own reality. I will never write something like that. Fuck. Their view their perception, their perspective. Of course, this book is not trying to say that gender is meaningless or not without impact on our culture, but instead it is trying to say that we are using it as a method of othering, of dismissing or diminishing another's perspective. You are that, I am this, therefore my perspective must be different than yours and possibly superior. And Le Guin, at least in my read of this book, brings in a concept that should be extremely familiar called Shifgrethor. I did my best there. Prestige, face, place, pride, relationship, and the untranslatable and all-important principle of social authority in the civilization. Or if you kind of want to just oversimplify what Le Guin is going for here, honor. This concept becomes vital to Genli's appreciation and respect towards these societies and people he's meeting and the distinction between those two entities. And almost in direct contradiction to a lot of science fiction books from this era that have themes around 
alien, alien identity core in their story that kind of come to a conclusion of othering, see stranger in a strange land. Painstakingly left hand of darkness is walking the reader to the other conclusion. These differences do matter, sure, they should be studied, researched, anthropology is important, understood, but none of that justifies treating anyone like an other. And it's funny, as ahead of its time as this book was when Le Guin released it, she's apparently come out and said she has regrets about not taking it even further. And I respect that so much. To me, that speaks so much to Le Guin's character to be able to admit that even trying to do the right thing with this story, her own biases came in and influenced what she told. If anything, I think it's just a great lesson on how to approach art without restraint. Push bounds ruthlessly and do your best when creating to put off your preconceptions while acknowledging it won't be perfect. That isn't a bad thing and that internal conflict can be represented within the work and make it something even more worth discussion. Prime example left hand of oh you're back hello hi i feel like i've made a friend last minute editing thoughts daniel here because i can't believe i didn't touch on the themes around balance that are in this book as well kind of a yin yang approach obviously with the masculine and feminine but also with the way these two nations are set up and how their ideologies kind of complement and oppose each other this continues into the unknown and the known the familiar and the unfamiliar but also even in the genre that takes takes place within the story. The first half is kind of this political intrigue setting up the bigger nations before the second leg of the story turns into almost a buddy adventure as they're trying to survive. And there's even these key moments throughout the book where you see what happens when these two things meet in unity and harmony. And of course, this is used uh, with Ginley when he actually goes and meets with a psychic who, contradictory to what he assumes, gives him straightforward answers and points out the, I think, absurd uselessness of knowing the answer to the wrong question perfect uselessness, something along those lines. There's these moments where all the things do balance and you get what looks like Le Guin trying to show you like a best of both worlds. And I think that's truly beautiful. And it's a opening of that eye for Genli that leads to him finally be able to have this true communication with his friend in the story. All this will make sense once you read it. And it's just, it's, beautiful. The actual just experience of taking in how meticulously this story is put together is just beautiful. But first, I just want to give a tremendous thank you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to help you get ahead of the competition, whether it's managing or starting out your business today. Day. Squarespace is here to educate and encourage entrepreneurs to reach new highs by using the tools they provide to create a beautiful, verbose website full of rich features, allowing you to engage with your audience as well as sell anything from products to content to time on your terms. Their asset library allows you to upload, organize, and access all your content from one place, as well as manage all your files from one central hub and use them across the entire Squarespace platform. And for anyone who does not have a background like myself in coding, Squarespace's flexible website templates provide you with a list of professional designs for every category in use, which you can customize to fit your needs on every device. But my personal favorite part is the Fluid Engine. You just drag and drop things into place to customize exactly how you want your website to look. So even though it's coming from their ecosystem, it reflects you. Whether it's blogs, email campaigns, appointment scheduling, gated member areas, and more, they've got everything you need to get started. So head on over to squarespace.com for your free trial. And when you're ready to make your first purchase, go to squarespace.com slash Daniel Green to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain and just take your business and propel it into the atmosphere of possibility of the square. Le Guin's prose are simultaneously some of the most beautiful at times I've ever come across and at others a bit too dry. There are sections of this book where it feels like we're just getting through some information and that's in every book. It's rare to come across a book that flows from beginning to end just masterfully. But I will say within Left Hand of Darkness when Le Guin is on the top of her game 
<laughs> there are multiple quotes I just wrote down in my notes here because of just how hard they hit. If you deny any affinity with another person or kind of person, if you declare it to be wholly different from yourself, as men have done to women, and class has done to class, and nation has done to nation, you may hate it or deify it, but in either case, you have denied its spiritual equality and its human reality. You have made it into a thing to which the only possible relationship is a power relationship, and thus you have fatally impoverished your own reality. You have, in fact, alienated yourself. By the way, some of these are just from that intro I was talking about, because it's that good. I am talking about gods, I am an atheist, but I am an artist too, and therefore a liar. Distrust everything I say, I am telling the truth. Oh! In reading a novel, any novel, we have to know perfectly well that the whole thing is nonsense, and then, while reading, believe every word of it. I just swear to God. The king was pregnant. I just like that line. An enemy in Carhide is not a stranger, an invader. The stranger who comes unknown is a guest. Your enemy is your neighbor. Dude, what? Is she about to release an album? Okay, but getting back to criticisms, through Genli and nearly the entire side cast, we do get characters who have personalities, strong motivations. All of that is pretty rock solid. We just don't get a ton of character growth. Now, there are characters who change their mind, and that is a type of growth, sure. But in terms of seeing some Randolphorian, gargantuan development of an individual, that's not really the point or focus here. So if you are a very character development-based reader, you might be a bit eh on this one because you're more just seeing people change their minds on subjects. But that's kind of the point. But in my conclusion here, stepping back to just talk about what Left Hand of Darkness is actually about, confront your prejudices. Embrace the unknown with empathy. Your perspective should change with time. That is not a bad thing. It is indicative of a life well lived. Experiences, challenges, and exploration should fuel your thirst for knowledge, not the opposite, just so that you can live a life a little bit more like a stranger walking a frozen tundra discovering the unknown. Duck agrees with me. It's not a duck, it's a goose, I think. And now I'm gonna live up by what I'm saying. Come here, friend. Do you want to get to know me? I'm not that stupid. I don't f with birds. This is an 8.5 out of 10 and gets the classic sticker for just being so far ahead of its time. God damn, Le Guin.